Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. My name is Aaron Kona. I'm co-founder and managing director of BWG Connect. We're a networking and knowledge sharing group of thousands of organizations who do exactly that. We network and knowledge share together to stay on top of the newest trends, strategies, pain points, shift changes, whatever it might be in the digital landscape as a whole. And it's been really interesting past 15 to 18 months is, you know, a lot of conversation before that was around, hey, the traditional retailer space. Now, huge shift into education, higher education, U.S. state, local governments, and of course, healthcare. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and, and kick it off. As I noted, just talking with 30 to 40 brands a week, uh, you know, this this thought around, hey, what's going on as a whole um, in in the the digital, the patient experience as a whole. So we got some great friends, um, great partners of the network at Proficient, at Adobe. Um, and, and we do a lot with connections along the way. And so what we're able to do is kind of do, uh, do a deep dive and a data analysis and kind of get together a report, you know, the, the three of us together. Um, and it's super interesting. And so we also have uh, Kyle. So we, you know, if we want to do some quick round table, um, just intros. Uh, Kyle, if you want to go first, um, quick uh, brief intro on yourself, uh, the organization, you know, really quickly. Then we can jump over to Paul, then we jump to Tom, and then we let's kick off with some of this data as a whole. But Kyle, if you want to jump in really quick, brief intro on yourself in, in, in BWG. I mean, I kind of gave it as Connect. So you want to just, you know, yourself and your role, then we can Perfect. jump to Paul and Tom. Yep. Perfect. Hello, everybody. Uh, Kyle Johnson here at BWG, and I co lead the, uh, the data initiatives here. So we go out to market and do. Uh, uh, surveys, thought leadership pieces in, in partnership with uh, with some of the uh, the true experts like Tom and Paul, and uh, it was a pleasure working with them. So back to you. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Paul, you want to jump in and then I'll kick it to Tom? Sure. My name is Paul Griffiths. I'm a principal in the healthcare practice at Proficient. Uh, my team and I think about digital health solutions and strategies uh, and really kind of putting putting all these different uh, technology pieces together and helping our clients um, with kind of strategic advice and, and, and make sure that we're, we're seeing the trends in the future. Um, so super excited to, to be here, especially because I think there's so much that's happening with uh, really kind of coming out of COVID, thankfully. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions about what, what was temporary, what's gonna stick around, how do we need to adapt for good? Um, so I'm really excited for this conversation today. Awesome. Tom, I'll kick to you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Paul. Uh, Tom Swanson, I head the healthcare and life sciences strategy and marketing team here at Adobe. And, you know, many of you might actually be surprised that Adobe has a healthcare uh, specific practice. Um, I've been with Adobe for, gosh, going on five years now, and I actually come from the life sciences side of the industry where I spent uh, well over a decade uh, kind of being an Adobe customer um, before I joined Adobe. So I have the perspective of having sat on that side of the table and tried to implement these tools in order to solve the problems that, you know, hopefully we're gonna have a chance to address here today. Awesome. So Kyle, let's, I'm going to kick it over to you. If you want to kind of start rolling through some of the data, and what I want to throw out there is it's kind of open commentary and questions as a whole. So if you see the data, you have a question on it, drop into the chat, the Q&A, email it to me. Chat and Q&A is going to be the quickest. Um, but if we want to roll through that and then, you know, Paul, Tom, we can have a conversation on it as well. But uh, Kyle, I'll kick it over to you to, to kind of kick us off here. Absolutely. So this will just be a preface to the conversation, and I'm going to keep it to five minutes or less. Um, the basis of this project that, uh, that we did with our friends at Proficient in Adobe was going out to uh, the healthcare executives themselves and basically orchestrating a, a survey. We heavily focused on providers that have that pr frontline experience with the patients, and we wanted to understand the top moderniz modernization initiatives uh, underway uh, in response to the pandemic, as well as just uh, longer term uh, initiatives that are taking effect. So let's just dive right in. This was a survey of 120, uh, uh, just over 120 respondents, uh, heavily uh, represented among the uh, C-level at, uh, at providers. So mostly hospitals, nearly 60% of our respondents were at, at regional and national uh, hospitals. Uh, but we also had a, a plethora of other respondents from pharmaceuticals, from medical devices, 
uh, from some of these other areas of the industry that layered on some additional feedback as well. And hopefully everybody has a chance to, uh, to just leap through that report. It's much longer than what I'll be going through here, but a lot of great uh, direct executive feedback that we were able to collect. So those are the high level metrics. Um, as Tom and I uh, were uh, speaking, uh, we really uh, zeroed in on three areas of focus that came through in this survey. Those were the self-service initiatives, uh, remote care and functionality, as well as personalization initiatives. Um, and we dedicated questions to each of those and, uh, and we'll go through some of the high level data points that we found in each. So starting with self-service, um, providers and healthcare executives uh, noted this is the most immediate and, uh, and top priority of focus that came through in the data. Over 90% of respondents are viewing this as at least a moderate priority and, uh, and a large portion, uh, nearly two thirds, were viewing it as a high priority. And that trend is only solidifying over time and becoming more pronounced. So um, folks are, are focusing on the self-service initiatives first to, um, to basically raise practice efficiency give more time back to uh, their practitioners to do what they do best and just create a uh, basically a greater ease of use with lower friction for, uh, for their patient bases. So just a few highlights. We found people are looking to some of these replicable and, and kind of routine workflows to automate first with self-service like payments, like knowledge directories and practitioner directories, um, accessing patient history. People want to uh, have more access to their own uh, their own data and information from the uh, consultations and um, and the care that they're receiving. Um, uh, as far as emerging opportunities, this is kind of the uh, the virgin territory that um, that the practices haven't necessarily gotten around to uh, in as mature a, uh, a sense yet. So automating bookings, preference management, customer support. Uh, ordering uh, drugs or devices through e-commerce and self-diagnosis, all on the horizon, but not as, as deeply penetrated yet. Moving to remote care, uh, obviously telehealth utilization spiked uh, in many cases near 100% at the peak of the pandemic. It's waned a bit since. You have some of the um, some of the overhanging questions about reimbursement rates and and long-term adoption. But one thing is clear: there is a new floor and a whole uh, a whole new audience of uh, of folks that are, are um, very open to and appreciative of having uh, the remote care and telehealth channel available to them. So uh, we expect this to be a secular growth area. All the practices continue to focus on it. And it's rolled out to routine care first and follow-up visits, kind of your basic functionality, um, booking, booking uh, remotely, but also we're starting to see the emergence of remote patient monitoring. And that's coming through with innovations on the device front as well as the analytics front. Um, and there's a lot of excitement that we found in the qualitative feedback from executives in, uh, in these areas. So much more on that in the report, but this is kind of the second leg of innovation that we found a lot of great content on in the survey. Lastly, we have personalization, which is of high importance, but the least mature of the three trends. And, uh, and we're seeing folks that want to uh, get much more advanced with uh, personalizing um, their data files, uh, tying into the preference management we just spoke about, as well as uh, better marketing. But these are, these are less penetrated than some of the, uh, the remote care uh, initiatives and the self-service initiatives. But on the horizon, maybe these start to really take hold in 2022 and beyond. So I'll leave it there. Those are a few of the uh, kind of key contributions from the report. There's a lot more detail on how far along people are with, uh, with each of these three legs of innovation in the full report. And you're more than welcome to follow up if you have any more questions. Um, I'll leave this slide up just to close, but here are just a handful of technology buckets or areas that pertain to each of the three segments. Aaron, I'm gonna turn it back to you. That's my final slide. No, it's super interesting, and, and you know, I'll kick it to, to Paul and Tom, but it's funny how much these were, you know, so we've done a call on the patient side, but just to reframe it, this was not done with the patient perspective, but the provider perspective. It drastically overlaps, right, with exactly what the patient side is looking for, so which is, which is really neat, but, you know, Paul, I'll kick it to you first. Self-service, remote, personalization, you know, three big topics here. Does this, 
does this surprise you? Um, any anything like that was super interesting here that um, either like you're like, well, yeah, we've been talking about this for a month or you know or, or for you know 15 months now, or wow, this one really shocked me. Would love to hear your thoughts on you know these three areas. Yeah, I think this is this is emblematic of you know a a, a saying that was going around, which is. Uh, you know, COVID was the chief digital transformation officer for a lot of healthcare organizations, right? It just, it, we saw five years of innovation happen in weeks, not months. Um, so what, what I think this is actually really reflective of is the fact that hospitals in particular had to stop orienting around provider schedules, which is actually kind of the, the core of the of the patient provider relationship for a hospital, and actually think about how to deliver care, um, kind of to survive, right? So it, I think that there was a radical change, and and the question that I have is, okay, how how short term is this or not, right? Um, these are three things that we talk to our clients about constantly. So my theme is always, you know, consumers want it easy, sticky, and pervasive. Uh, meaning they want it to be simple and frictionless. Uh, they they want it um, to to be kind of draw them in and kind of learn about them over time. Um, and they want to be able to do it. You know, they want to be able to transact on whatever device they want at whatever time and and not feel like they're kind of hemmed in by some organizational decision. And that's what a lot of these 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 three kind of big use cases are about. So. On the one hand, I'm I'm not surprised. I think the really interesting question is how much of this is going to last, and how much of this was temporal. Um, and I think that's that's a question a lot of our clients are struggling with now. How do we make how do we make business value out of this? Right, Tom. Your your thoughts to these three? Like, do they surprise you? Uh, does it fit in line with what you, I mean? You've lived in this space for a long time. Yeah, and no, Aaron, it, it didn't surprise me at all, right? And I think that, um, you know, what I guess was a bit of a surprise, right? And I want to go back to something that Paul just mentioned, right? Which was that historical, historically, or the kind of the legacy engagement model was one that was very much centered on the availability or the expertise of the healthcare professional, right? Where the HCP or the doctor, right, was in the center of the engagement model. One of the profound changes that we've seen since the pandemic, and it's um, illustrated in each of these three big themes that we've identified here, is this idea of the patient or the consumer moving into the center of the engagement model. Right now, patient centricity is something that in the industry we, we have been talking about for years, but it was always the question of, well, what does that mean and how do you accomplish it? I find it really interesting that, you know, having COVID-19 act as the uh, chief transformation officer for healthcare, right? actually kind of forced that to happen, um, you know, in terms of because of the changes in the engagement model and kind of the physical accessibility of the HCPs, it forced this dramatic change in, well, okay, now we actually have to go where our customer is and engage them how, when, and, you know, they want to be engaged as opposed to, like Paul said, kind of the organizational or the administrative decision-making being, well, there, you know, the HCP is available on this day through these hours, and, you know, if you want to see him or her, you have to accommodate their schedule, not yours, right? So I think that change, and Paul, I want to address something that you mentioned as well regarding kind of the temporal nature of these changes. I, I'm of the opinion that kind of once you give consumers, right, a taste of being in the center of the engagement model, once that genie is out of the bottle, it's incredibly hard to put it back in, right? So I think, you know, as we move into kind of whatever, and, and I know we all hate the term new normal, right, whatever that is going to look like, 
I think you're going to see more emphasis on kind of the patient or the customer. And I think that we're just going to continue to see growth in these three themes as payer, as the providers and the payers and the customers themselves become more comfortable with the customer being at the center of the engagement model as opposed to the HCP. Yeah, 100%. And what's really interesting is in this flip, you now have, you know, the, the patient, you know, who's in a traditional sense, the customer it now is requiring it, right? And it wasn't necessarily out of original, you know, thought, I, I want to do this, but COVID put them in that position. And we can break apart little age demographics in a little bit, but um, just a question comes over here, which I'd love to get into because we can dig into some of the data here. Uh, in regards to, uh, and others, if you have questions, drop in the questions tab or the chat. Uh, the remote patient monitoring, any ideas in the area of IoT with respect to connectivity and such? Uh, wearables, devices, med tech products. Um, I mean, it popped up here. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I'd mean, I, I, love I, to hear your thoughts. The, any academic medical center right now is is looking at um, or running, you know, running, you know, effectively trials on remote patient monitoring. I think there's a, in a, in a really disease specific way. So I, I think what is happening and, and you can see this innovation happen, um, again, a little bit more tied into particular service lines or particular disease treatment states, but it's, it's, it's this acknowledgement that, um, you know, hospitals how to support long-term you know long-term disease management remotely because they just had to and then as tom said once once you do that why would you go back um so i, I think i think there's a lot more um i think there's a lot more kind of small uh, in innovation kind of componentry innovation so looking at hey we used to have to force someone to come in um so we could you know we could check their vitals can we get that information remotely I think that's coming about the same time that, you know, frankly, there's a lot of good data around uh, keeping patients in their home and um, for certain disease states, it's actually better. So I, I think you'll you'll see on the remote patient monitoring piece, a lot more of this kind of, you know, small eye innovation. And it's, it's going to be around, you know, specific, specific disease management, or it's going to be about caring for aging, you know, aging parents. And figuring out a way of how to get that data, you know, back to their medical care professionals, not not just you know from this kind of um, you know a remote nurse program. So there's a lot of questions around like how do we just keep tabs on 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 patients when they're outside of our facility? And um, that's a really radical that's a really radical uh, you know change to thinking. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't that long ago that the definition of a patient was they were admitted. And they were in your building, right? And and a, still a lot of the data structures re represent that. So I think the challenges that remote patient monitoring has um, is really just getting getting the systems to catch up and be more porous and allow this data to be ingested in a way that's going to be helpful. Um, but I think that's that's why it's going to be again. I'm I'm probably a, a little more seeing it on the on the disease states uh, and on the specific treatment plans, innovation and remote monitoring there. But I don't know, Tom. What do you what do you think? I think the ubiquitous nature of these. Oh, this thing that we're all wearing. What? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, and I'm sure each of you saw the announcement. I think it was over the weekend, right? That Apple wants to actually have access to and be able to contribute data to EHRs, right? And that Apple is working directly with Cerner. Of course, Epic is, you know, being Epic and kind of holding off, uh, you know, on, on partnering with anybody right now. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting um, extension of the fact that these wearable devices, right, have gone from just monitoring, uh, you know, whether you were exercising or not, to being able to do clinical grade EKGs, right, to be able to measure blood pressure to, you know, that there are applications you can do now where just through the skin contact sensors, you can actually do blood glucose measurements, right? I mean, these are all clinical grade things that used to require the patient or the customer 
going to the doctor and getting these tests performed, right? And and I mean, I know um, I'm guilty, right? Of you know, if you know you have your annual physical coming up, right? Suddenly exercising, eating better, doing things right in order to make your numbers look better. Um, you know, when you're going to the doctor, right? Which is not a realistic snapshot of how you live, right? Where these things actually do that kind of real-time monitoring and can give your your provider or your payer kind of real-time data as to what your lifestyle choices are and, and kind of how healthy you are, right? And if that enables me as a patient or a customer to get a personalized benefits package, to have you know my deductibles set based on my my wellness versus you know these aggregated numbers, um, you know to avoid having to go physically to the doctor's office because I can share all of this real time information directly with my provider or. And this is where I, you know, I view the potential partnership between Apple and um, EHR systems as a good thing, not necessarily a creepy thing, right? Because how cool would it be to be able to manage your own electronic health record here, right? And have it completely consumable by any hospital or any doctor's office or any payer organization that you choose to share it with, right? And where it's updated daily, real time, based on the real things that you're doing, right? I mean, the data is there, why not capture it and use it in a way that best suits you and the proactive management of your wellness versus, you know, uh, some other less patient-centric way? There's some great stuff coming into it, and what's what's key, and a lot of it is around this data, right? And I want, I'm going to get to those questions, but just something that's popping into my head is, with this data, right? And I think uh, with this data that if we can share it with them, it enhances the chat bots, the knowledge and directories. If you're downloading it and they know who you are and you're signing in, the telehealth portals. Are you? Do you have ongoing diabetes? They know it right away. Right, which then also ties into remote patient monitoring. I think you know, um, you know, disease states like you were saying, Paul. This key piece of collecting and storing data and gathering it in a real time, real world environment is just it powers almost all of these things. Maybe outside of automating. And, and Aaron, that's that's the point I was going to make earlier before I got sidetracked by myself was that these three themes actually all completely tied together and support each other in some capacity, right? It's not like self-service is isolated from kind of remote care and remote services. It's not like self-service is isolated from personalization or personalization isolated from remote care. All of these things are predicated upon, right, having access to data, using that data to better understand your patient or your customer, and then being able to personalize their experience through the channels in which they choose to be engaged based upon that data, right? So it's truly the marrying of data with content and then delivering it in a way that makes sense, you know, to the patient as well as the provider. Yeah, my, my hope is that we'll see, I mean, I, when you were talking about Apple, I was thinking about Google's PHR, way back in the day, which didn't integrate with Epic, but it was basically a digital shoebox, right? You kind of like put your pieces of paper in and it was static. And I think what we're talking about now is much more dynamic. So, you know, pretty soon it's going to be, you know, Siri is going to say, hey, Tom, don't have that second margarita. I can see that you did not go to the gym, right? We're, we're going we're to get to that point. Yeah. And, then, and then we'll see what happens. Well, I mean, I know, Paul, that... Uh... Is it uh, Google is part of kind of the voice recognition work that they're doing with Alexa now mm -hmm. is to actually have Alexa able to tell, right, if you are under stress or mm -hmm. under duress of some kind, just based on changes in your inflection. Yeah. Right. So I don't I don't think we're that far away from having Alexa say, you know, hey, Tom, are you all right? <laughs> 
<laughs> right. <laughs> are, you, are you feeling okay? Do I need to call the doctor? It's it's crazy. And there's a bunch of here I want to get to questions because they come in and they're awesome. Um, we might have to repeat this and invite everybody back because I think there's enough to talk about here for another hour and a half, two hours, and or maybe it's a in-person roundtable where we you know, sit around and have beers till uh, Alexa tells us to stop. Um, so uh, here we go. How do your tech? I'm going to address these kind of in order, and we're going to blend them together. So I'm going to read a couple at a time. How do your technology? How do your technologies and support EHR? Uh, so I'm reading this. How do you? How do your technologies and support EHR integration? Will technologies such as telehealth portals or fitness pro platforms such as MyFitnessPal integrate into EHR as well? And then the next one is are you know. EMR EHR systems assisting these key areas, key areas or are providers building and or acquiring. And then there's some more on like IoT, PII data, right? Uh, bringing the human centered design back into it. So old days at IDO kind of a thought there, but we'd love to hear, you know, how do technologies, you know, support EHR integration you know, telehealth, my fitness pal, integrate, you know, all these fun things. You can probably see the same questions I'm looking at. Paul. Sure. Um, so I think that there's a there's a a, a couple different breakpoints in the system. Uh, there is certainly a lot of health data that I might track and I could share with my primary care. And there are some primary care doctors and models which are new and exciting and innovative and are about spending more time with patients. Um, sometimes that data is helpful for them. Where, where all of this is really being very useful right now is an emergent medical situation. So if you, you know, to, to talk about self-service remote personalization, um, really the, the big opportunity, the, the, the really close opportunity is building tools that people can use so they can recognize that they're having a problem. And then once they recognize having a problem, you, you tell them the point of care that they can receive. And so there are, um, there are Alexa skills now. So there's some hospitals who built, for example, Alexa skills where, you know, you can talk to them and, and that's really just a way to, to initiate uh, an escalation um, to have either a nurse call if they're enrolled in a certain program or just reach out to them. And that's just a different form, right? But it's, it's, it's kind of, again, self-service remote and personalized. You have that all the way to, again, people who have certain disease states. And if they're taking their glucose, monitoring their glucose, and it's above a certain amount, um, they, you know, uh, a team is alerted and then they take kind of proactive action. So I think the, the data that we're, all the data we're gathering can serve as really successful escalation points right now. I don't think that um, the, you know the EMR systems are really trying to trying to figure out what they are because they you know they started off as as really kind of being in health and then they moved into revenue cycle management and billing and then now there's kind of this like CRM quality to it um, but but actually sticking a lot of maybe meaningful maybe not meaningful data into an EHR doesn't make a ton of sense um, that's that's a that's that creates a a, a lot of different questions and challenges. Um, I'm hoping that where we'll get to is something a little bit more like what what Tom was was alluding to, where if I'm the patient and it's my data, I can decide to connect with you. And when I'm done with you, I can take back that connection. So right now, as a patient, there's an asymmetry of information. The hospital collects data on me, right? I go in for labs. The hospital has that data. Um, if you ever try to get your medical records from a, from a hospital, uh, you often take a visit to the, the bowels of the system somewhere in the basement to the medical records office and some of the last Xeroxes and fax machines are there um, and they, they give you a, a physical copy, right? That, that is still sadly a lot of the, what a lot of the, the healthcare system runs on. Um, so I think that piece of, of who owns the data and what my record is and my record as a person versus my record as here's a series of incidents that I have had as a patient with your healthcare system that is somewhat incomplete, which is which is really the, the EHR right now. Um, I, I think it's probably more likely that we will find systems that will augment what we shouldn't put in the EHR, um, but the interconnection between the two will be a lot more valuable. 
and that's where Cerner and Epic and these other you know major systems are really focusing right now. How at least do we figure out how to safely share data so that someone can monitor something and, and take appropriate escalation? Uh, but I'm I'm hopeful that all of this data that we collect about ourselves will become will become ours, and that will actually help us get better care as patients. Um, so I, I think that that's my that's my very optimistic way of how it might play out. No, and Paul, I I agree uh, or am as equally hopeful, right? Because I think ultimately that's where we want to go, right? And I think it spans healthcare, right? Uh, uh, I, I mean, or extends beyond healthcare, where it's like we as consumers, whether we're consumers of healthcare or any other industry, right, that we want to be able to manage our data and share it with whomever you know we choose to and then like you said be able to pull that back right one if we're no longer going to continue to do business with you mm -hmm. um the the asymmetry of the healthcare system i think is is a serious problem right um and there is it's not, not a problem it's an existential risk for the healthcare systems now I think what COVID has shown is that it's actually not good. It's it's a risk point for healthcare healthcare organizations to lock up their data because when it when crisis happens, then everyone kind of, it needs to get it back, and it's very inefficient, right? Well, and 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 again, and that's exactly where I was going is that I think that the pandemic once again, right, is is littered with silver linings as far as the healthcare industry and patient centricity is concerned right because the lack of kind of collaboration and and cross ecosystem sharing right was exactly what you said an existential crisis right for healthcare when the pandemic hit right and suddenly there was a real compelling reason to share that data right which showed that the system is actually capable of doing it you just have to be willing, yeah. right? And and you have to be a willing collaborator with other potential competitors, right? Within the system with the eye towards it's ultimately better for the customer or the patient, even if it may, you know, eliminate some perceived competitive value, right? That That you think you may have, right? And so, I mean, I think what, what it's going to take is that the technology for the collection and distribution and democratization of all of this data exists. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a willingness and an openness on the part of all of the participants in a given healthcare ecosystem to sh openly share and be transparent about the sharing of that data in order to land where I think consumers want us to land. Yeah, and everyone, everyone, the 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 green field is creating an experience that's so good that people want to stick with you, which is soon going to be how everyone's going to compete. But you know, I was joking about this. People talk about you know the 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 razor and blade as a business model, right? Like you you own the you own the razor and you sell the blades. I think no one likes that. No one wants that as a bit. Like no consumer likes being trapped in a system, even if it makes good business. It's a short term thing. Uh, it's a short-term advantage, and I, I think now the the healthcare systems that are that are most primed to be disrupted um, are the ones who are who are not thinking how do I put all this together for a better experience? Because um, I do think that I do think there's downsides to Apple and Amazon getting into healthcare. And I think they're just it's, it's it 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 doesn't make sense for a patient to necessarily put you know, to try to engage with these big tech companies even further on that. So I, I don't think hospitals need to be worried about them directly interfering. I think that hospitals have to think about, hey, our business model is predicated on some ideas that are really, that really don't make sense as if you think about ourselves as consumers, right? I, I should be able to take my stuff with me. I, you know, it should be about me. Like I, I, I do want to receive this care. Um, and if, if we can get that right, to be really positive, if we can get that right, I mean, physicians will be happier, patients will be happier and healthier, you know, the, the system will be more efficient uh, and ideally, you know, you know, 
profitably help, helpful uh, to everyone and, and the communities they serve. Um, so I think there's a lot of upsides in, into going all in on that experience. It's just, you know, it's complicated. Right. I mean, I want to tag off on that just a little bit because you're talking about complications. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, uh, data as a whole. What are the implications on healthcare and health insurance? And how do you handle PHI and PII with these integrations as a whole? I mean, it's a big concern, right? Um, across the board. What do you, how do you handle the, the PII data? Um, well, I mean, I think this is my opinion, <laughs> right? I mean, not financial <laughs> advice. That's what that's you have. Correct. That's right. right. I mean, I think ultimately, right, you have to treat that data as it is the property of the individual, right, for which you have collected that data, and that it should be up to me, right, as that patient or that consumer, who I share it with and how it's used. Right. I mean, I think the industry has a certain kind of requirement to, or due diligence around security, right, in terms of protecting the data and making it accessible only to those, right, that that need or should have access to it. Um, and then privacy, right, should be dictated by the consumer or the individual, not the company that actually has collected the data, right? And I think if you apply that methodology to healthcare information, right, what's, what's going to have to happen is that the legal and regulatory bodies that govern things like HIPAA are going to have to catch up with the technology and the consumer demands um, as opposed to uh, the other way around, right? Because as a consumer, and this is part of what, you know, Paul, you and I have just been chatting about, is I should be able to dictate who has access to my data and how it's used, right? So if I want a company or a provider or an insurance company to market to me specifically based upon a disease state, and I give them permission to do so, they should be allowed to do so, right? As opposed to, you know, hiding behind the fact that, well, HIPAA says I can't do that. It's like, well, what do you mean, right? It's my data, it's my personalized experience, and I'm giving you permission, so go ahead, right? You, you need to have the legal and regulatory environment catch up with what the consumer is demanding and expecting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've unfortunately read read uh, HIPAA and, and its requirements many times for this point, and it's just helpful to say it was written, you know, the, the most sophisticated piece of technology when HIPAA was written was the fax machine, and that's still actually considered a secure communication protocol because you can see where it starts and you can see where it ends, and copies aren't theoretically, you know, uh, kept. But... Uh, but that's the, you know, the, the state of the world that we're living in now in terms of what it means for me to participate in my health digitally is very different from 20 plus years ago, how I might be exploited you know, for information I've shared about myself. So I, 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 think, it's a, I think it's a really interesting question. I think fortunately, a lot of these even technologies that we're looking at on the screen, there is inherently a kind of permission uh, in, in that, so to the extent that you're serving me on my healthcare journey, which is complicated and doesn't always require being in a hospital, as we know now, um, it's it's really it's really beneficial. So I just again to be the optimist, see a lot of these marketing tools and technologies, which you know are used to sell everything from Sprite to subprime mortgages. <laughs> And, and I think, man, can't we use this stuff to get people healthier? Like, don't we think we've amassed all this knowledge? Uh, and, and what are we using it for to sell, you know, people new handbags? Um, and and I, I just feel like we, we, we should be able to figure this out. And so I think the organizations that are really willing to sit down and, and understand the, the, what they're comfortable with um, are able to get a little further a little faster. And we, we've had a lot of great innovative ideas go by the wayside because we got really close 
and then a client's legal counsel would say, yeah, we're not 100% sure. And I think that's that's really disappointing. Again, I think I think COVID showed that people were clamoring for you know for this information. So we were we were helping clients stand up chatbots because their phone systems were down because so many people were calling in about how do I get a COVID test. So when push comes to shove, I I think there's also you know innovation finds a way. So this you know these these ideas that came out now. Um, as as pilots i think now the hard question is how do we integrate them back to our systems how are they just part of doing business and how many of them will kind of you know survive um and i think hip, hip is one of those those sticks that can get can get used to squash innovation i i'm hopeful that having seen the necessity having had you know patients go through it and still be happy with the organizations uh, they'll be willing to give it another shot yeah Love it. Um, any other questions that are coming through, uh, drop them in the questions of the chat there. Um, you know, another one that just uh, that came uh, in here that we've been trying to get to is, and then how do you bring in the human, human-centered design, human-computer interaction? Um, and I don't know if this goes back to Tom, kind of like the pre-call chit-chat. The human-computer interaction is a lot easier for a younger demographic than it is for an older demographic on a percentage basis. Um, and so, and yet, it's an older demographic that generally would you know, makes a, a higher use of the healthcare system as a whole. So, mm -hmm. it's well, interesting. You get people who are driving demand and people who are currently using it. Well, and what we were chatting about before the call started, Aaron, was the fact that the older demographic, right, that has historically been the most engaged in their healthcare ecosystem, was also the most vulnerable, right, to the pandemic. And so they were the ones that kind of not only were forced to seek alternative means of engagement, but then also really driving a significant shift in means of engagement. I mean, my, my parents are in their 70s, right? And they, through the pandemic, discovered the joys of telehealth. And, you know, it, it was my mother who actually said, it's like having a house call like they had in the 50s <laughs> and 60s. Right, because now the doctor is coming to you as opposed to you going to the doctor. And Aaron, I think that's where you can begin to extend and kind of build in the human interaction through these digital channels, right? Where that the fact that you as the patient are in the center of the engagement model, the doctor is coming to you at a time and a place that is convenient for you. And then you have access to all of the materials, the data, anything it is, right, that at your fingertips through these digital digital channels, that is a more personalized experience than you would receive in that personal face-to-face -face experience, right? And we've actually seen, Paul, this is something you and I have chatted about before, that we've seen metrics regarding empathy actually increase through the use of telehealth for the very reasons that we're discussing, right? Is that instead of investing 30, 40, 45 minutes into a doctor's appointment where you still are not, have not seen the doctor, right? And you're 45 minutes into it, um, actually having the doctor and you agree upon a time and the doctor calls at that time, the end result is that the, the HCP is spending more quality time with the patient than the churn and burn approach to getting as many people through the office as possible. And that, that kind of personalized communication and convenience and access is creating a more empathetic healthcare system, right, which is, I, I think, kind of counterintuitive, right? That you would think that a digital or remote engagement is more personal than a face-to-face -face one, but that's what the data is showing us. Yeah, and um, I'd also add a, a couple things. One, um, you know, 50% of any of these kind of initial interactions 
um, uh, of, of health searches or engagements online are done for a loved one. So I don't have as much you know heartburn about that um, because even if it's you know oftentimes it's a it's a adult child of someone who's you know thinking about how do I care for my you know for my aging parents right that's a really big demographic so um, there's there's a lot of care that's being delivered and um, again even if it's not through the person who's looking for it they may be conversational or at least more comfortable with the technology I, I mean specifically how to get the voice of the consumer in there you know we we tend to back up and and talk about uh personas so what's the audience you want to activate um how can you understand who they are and build some of that empathy um and and using these kind of you know you know personas just being ideas of 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 example people and their journeys um, that we look at, okay, what's a what's a customer journey for, um, you know, for a maternity uh, patient? Okay, well, that's something that's that's knowable. We we you know we have experience and, and research on that. Well, let's start to try to put ourselves in in the patient's shoes and understand if this is a good or bad experience. So I think you know the more the more you can look at your own experience delivery through the eyes of the the patients who are receiving it. Um, the more places that you'll find little tweaks that you can make, that will make a huge difference. Um, I mean, you know, one one story on that we were working with a client, and um, and it was a uh, it was a cancer program, and they had this the, the stage where there was this kind of fall off. So if people kind of missed their appointments, the chance of them coming back was really low. And what we realized is it was all just like a communication thing. They would they would go to reschedule. And and they would get like this automated response that was like, you missed your appointment. Here's what to do. And it was just they needed to change it to be a little nicer. Right. And so these like small little moments where you're thinking about, yeah, you're stressed. You're concerned you have cancer. You've made a mistake. You've missed an appointment. Uh, how are you feeling in that moment? And what's the experience we're delivering? And it was like functional, but it, but it wasn't it wasn't very empathetic. Um, and I think that's that's the difference between ex experience and a process, right? The the process is like super efficient, and and we need that uh, in healthcare. But an experience is you're putting in the empathy and you're understanding how I'm helping you get to that next next action. Um, and so that the the experience really is a is a triumph of a process, and it requires an understanding of the human on the other side. I like uh, just as you're talking. You know, and, and I'm going back to something, you know, Paul, people are struggling with. Is it around to stay? And when you look at personalization, mm -hmm. um, self-service and remote, I flip as a as a patient, as a consumer to how I buy anything else. Right. I want it to be very relevant to me. Uh, I want to be able to sit in my house and I want to order it and have it delivered to me. Um, and in those companies that are able to do that, Excel. Amazon, Apple, right? Customer focus, customer center, which you're kind of talking about here as well. It's going to be a requirement for healthcare organizations as a whole to figure it out in that aspect, right? Mm -hmm. And um, those that can personalize and keep data safe. I mean, we, in that space, we got GDPR, um, but in CCPA, uh, but it's the exact same thing. How can you give the patient the right patient, the right information, the right treatment at the right time in the right spot. Um, and that's sometimes remote, but sometimes it's not. But you being able to discern that, then that takes data. <laughs> um, so I think uh, my personal opinion, it's what it's or I mean, it's it's here. It has to be because patients are consumers of other products and they've spoken in already in that segment, but this is exactly what they want. So yeah, I mean, I think certainly going back to my the, the theme on the escalation, what I want is a healthcare system that's ready to catch me uh, when when I'm gonna fall, and not after I've fallen, right? And so if you think about that, that requires some level of anticipation and some level of understanding where I am. Um, that's a really good experience. You talk about Amazon and, and Apple, and really their success was not technology i mean we we think of it that way but if you look at amazon you know uh jeff jeff bezos who, who just stepped down his 
first shareholder letter is obsessed with the customer. And if you look at what they've done and all the decisions they made were around, how do we understand who our customer is and what they want? And that was kind of the, the primary way that they made decisions. Um, if you look at you know, Apple and the iPhone, nothing in the iPhone was really new. What they did is they put it together in a completely different way. And so this idea that ex experience is actually where these big technology companies have gotten really, really good. Um, and if they've gotten so good, we don't even notice anymore. Like it's not even a surprise when I'm searching for something on my phone and I go to Google Maps on my desktop and it knows that, right? I kind of, I don't even notice anymore. Like that's amazing. And I, I think that we're very conditioned to see the seams, right? And the breakdown and, and healthcare is a really complicated continuity of care with a lot of rough patches and a lot of seams. And it doesn't feel that important to, uh, I don't know, consolidate billing systems between our physician organization and our hospital to pick one. But when a patient gets two bills and is confused, right? Like that's, that's not a great experience. Um, and so I think ex competing on experience is where, again, these, we think of world-class companies that's actually what they they are really really doggedly focused on, and I think that's that's something that's that's helpful. So, um, you know, I have some canned talks that I give to executive teams that are you know they're ner they were nervous about Amazon before, maybe they were nervous about them again. Apple Care is also launched, maybe they're nervous about that, but it, it's it's really about the experience. Like, how do you win loyalty? And and loyalty is no longer physical proximity. So the other side of this is great self-service, remote and personalization. I can talk to a doctor in another state, right? At a remote telehealth visit. Um, I think that's that's the that's the other side of this. Of the reason to to do it is it's good. You can you can get out there, but if you don't do it, this is now where the competition is moving. And I think they're the early you know the the early adopters, especially um, you know especially organizations that have great brands. If they can parlay that into great experiences, that that's that's really lasting value. Yeah, awesome. Well, I see we're we're literally right at time here, and um, I I do want to say a quick thank you, Paul, Tom. You guys are awesome friends, partners, supporters of you know a lot of different organizations within the network on multiple different levels. And anybody, if you have a chance to follow up, more than happy. It's a networking knowledge sharing session. Anybody you want to be connected with. 100% worth a follow-up conversation uh, with Tom and Paul. Um, you know the the content, the feedback around uh, this data study that we did. Um, I, I don't know if Paul or Tom has it, but we can we can make sure that we connect you with them. It's 100% worth a follow-up conversation. Um, you know, I'll say like, hey Paul, quick 30-second like key takeaways, and I'll jump it over to Tom, and then we'll wrap up and make sure people will get to their next meeting without being late. Sure. Uh, I mean, key takeaways consumers demand better experiences pay attention at your peril that's my 10 word summary no, that's excellent and and paul i'll jump on top of that right it's not accidental that we have been interchangeably using the words consumer and customer with patient or plan member right because i think there are many many lessons for the healthcare industry to learn from other industries because consumer behavior is consumer behavior, right? And every single one of your patients is a consumer of some other industry, and they are making value judgments around their experience with you based upon the experiences that they have with Marriott, with Disney, with Delta Airlines, right? I mean, all of those things are where those consumer expectations come from, that's what the healthcare industry needs to be paying attention to. Awesome. Love it. We got to do another one of these. It was fantastic. Thanks to everybody for sending in all the questions, the Q&A, the comments, everything. It was it was fantastic. It was fun. Uh, look for a follow-up email from us. We'll be sure to catch you with Paul and Tom. Hope everybody has a fantastic Wednesday. Everybody take care. Stay safe. We're going to wrap this up uh, right now such that uh, you can get on to your next meeting without being late. Thanks again, guys. All right. Thanks, Paul. Awesome. Thanks so much. Awesome. Good to see you.